Good afternoon. It's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker for this colloquium today, Jan Otten Fossen. He's from Norway, um, has an, an impressive career. Jan is a physicist. He did his uh, PhD in 83, and after this, a number of uh, interesting postdocs, either in Canada, MIT, Denmark. Since the year of 2000, Jon is a professor at NTNU, uh, has a, a very impressive list of publications. Uh, recent researches are, research, are related to, to plays and, and several types of applications. Jon has very straight, let's say, contacts with uh, Brazil, we can see several joint um, works, and more recently, he's working here with uh, with our, co our our colleague Caetano Miranda. Jan, is a is a pleasure to, to have you here, and please welcome. I need this. Now you can hear what I say. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for the introduction. Um, as always, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I was going to, since this was mentioned, I'm working on, in, uh, I'm in the area of soft and complex matter physics. And the one material that I've been studying for 25 years now is clay, clay, clay material. Um, I will mention that um, should it was mentioned, I come from Norwegian University of Science and Technology. That's where I work, which is located here in the middle of Norway. Uh, this is our campus. This is the Norwegian fjord. And our lab is located here where the arrow is. If you know, yeah, so our lab is called Soft and Complex Matter Lab. This is our web address. If you want to learn more about what we are doing. Uh, our lab is inside this building. This is not a fake picture, it's real. I have a witness sitting here that this can actually happen in, uh, in our city. It already happened several times this, this year. There's a good activity this year for Aurora Borealis. So, as I mentioned, our lab is here. Our uh, uh, what is interesting about this landscape is that uh, it's all clay. The material is on top of the rock is clay. Uh, um, so it's everywhere and it's been there for a long time. So that makes clay an interesting sustainable material. I'll come back to that. When I started to work on clays, and before that, when I did PhD and so on, my motivation was sort of like this, curiosity-driven research. So I wanted to understand what was going on. And uh, like the, this is the first scientist. Uh, eventually, as I studied clays for some time, I came to this realization that we have, uh, created many in, innovative solutions, but we don't have problems to go with them. So now we are at this stage and we are trying to do some innovation. So as, and this, this cartoon illustrates the same message. So when I started to work on clays as a physicist, there were not many physicists that worked on this material. Only, uh, mainly uh, geologists, geochemists, and so on. A very few physicists. But what I, the reason I started with this is that I thought I could come with something from physics, basic physics that could contribute to new developments in, this, in, uh, in that area. These days, one reason to, study, to, to actually study a material like clay is uh, sustainability, which is a an important word these days. And it's about uh, say, using natural, non-toxic materials instead of the materials that we use uh, this, these days for most of our products. 
So that's part of the motivation for, for studying clays. So these are the lifetime of things when you throw them in the ocean. It's just to illustrate sustainability issues. So when you say the word clay to people, if I ask if I ask these questions to people, they and they ask what what do you think about when the, the first thing that comes to your mind when I say clay, people answer often mud, and it's true. In some situations, in most situations where you find clay, it's it's a mud-like material. But then you start to think about why is it mud and why does it have this macroscopic, mechanical, geological behavior? It uh, actually, then you have to actually look at why why is it soft, sticky, and and slippery? Why can it be soft in the processing and hard in the use? Some examples. Uh, there is water involved in it, uh, and then um, you, then you have to start to look at what, how is it, how is the clay made up from the nanoscale. So that's where we where, where we start, and it's also motivated by all these applications that are not new; they are old, uh, but they are what I would say low tech applications. They all are more or less about mixing clay particles into something and that mixing changes the properties of the say main host mat material in, in in most cases like clays in toothpaste it changes the rheological properties of the toothpaste uh, uh, in 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 plastics in papers clays are additives that change the flow properties and mechanical properties of these materials either in the production phase, in the use phase, or both. But it's more appear based on empirical research, not really based on understanding what is going on from a physicist's point of view. So why does clay have all these applications? It's because what they are on the nanoscale. So if you start in an ele electron microscope image, you will see that Clays are nanolayered materials, like graphene. It has some uh, similarities with graphene in that sense, but also some important differences. So, and this nanoscale layer layering, you can. This it's also visual at all the length scales from micro. Or this is from centimeters to geological scales. You can see that there is an underlying anisotropic nature to the to the to, to the clay materials. So when you look at this closely then these clay are typically clay particles are typically decks of nano cards. Each of these cards is a single crystal. So there is a one they are now one nanometer thick single crystals. The dimensions in this direction can vary from one clay type to another. And what distinguishes the different types of clay is actually what kind of metals you have in the middle part here. Because this is uh, tetrahedra, tetrahedra, and octahedra in the middle. And in the middle of the octahedra, there are some metals sitting. And what kind of metal is sitting here gives name to the clay. So by stacking these cards, on top of one another, you get, you, you get these particles, and from those particles, you get microscopic behaviors. One important characteristic of these cards is that they have a charge. Because there are some metallic substitutions in, in this middle layer, that translates to a surface charge of the clay particles. So they are have a negative surface charge. And in order to compensate for that, there are cations sitting here. So in these systems, we distinguish between intralayer cations, the metals sitting inside here, and interlayer cations, the ones that are sitting in between the clay cards. Then there are some positive edge charges on these cards because you cut some, some bonds at the edge of, the, of these uh, one nanometer thick crystals. If you take this system of dexo cards and expose it to water, it swells. 
I mean, there are some clays that swell and some that do not swell. In this talk, I will I will talk about the ones that swell. So then we distinguish between crystalline swelling and osmotic swelling. When you have start with the dry system and you expose that say clay powder or this meaning uh, clay powder where the grains in the powder are these dextrocarts, expose it to humid air, you will get intercalation of water into the system layer by layer until you reach three layers. Then if you expose it to liquid water, you get into the osmotic swelling regime where the cards separate completely. So this in this, uh, and there, then the, you can uh, think of, well, you need to understand what is going on in, in, in this phase and also in, in this phase. And this is what I've been working on for say 20 years before I started to more to think about what we can use this for. So back to the crystalline swelling. So what, what, what we have are these uh, clay sheets. They are charged, as I mentioned. There are cations there to compensate for that charge and they stack. So when you add water to this system, water can go into the system and the system swells. So you get this change in the despacing in one, in one direction, from one car to another. So it, we start off typically at one nanometer. When you add water, it typically goes to, well, just to say that the way to measure this is with x-rays. This is with polar diffraction. It's easily visible in polar, in polar diffraction. So the control parameters for this process is temperature and relative humidity of the water vapor around your sample. So let's say at high temperature, at ambient relative humidity around the clay sample, the sample is dry and there is the stacking distance is one nanometer, 10 angstrom. When you cool it down, uh, still ambient relative humidity, one water layer intercalates. So this distance, two and a half angstrom, corresponds to the size of a water molecule. Then pull it down further, it goes to 15 ang angstrom, two, two water molecules. You can do the same exercise by keeping the temperature constant and changing the relative humidity. So at ambient temperature, you, you start out with a one layer of water in, the, in this particular clay, and then you uh, increase the relative humidity still at ambient temperature, and it drops up to about 15 ang angstrom. So this has been studied for years by many people in different types of clays and, and so on. One interesting thing is what, what, what do we mean exactly by one and two layers of water in the, in the, in the interlayer space? Uh, the water actually goes in there because water is the dipole and it is attracted to the cations that are sitting in, the, in there. And the water coordinates itself with the cations. So one in the one water layer situation, it's like this uh, coordination number of three typically for this clay. And for the two water layer situation, which is here, coordination number of six typically. These round things here are, are water molecules. So it's not like you have a layer of water, liquid water in two dimensions floating around. You have water associated with the cations, each, each cation. Typically, there is one cation sitting per square nanometer in such a system in the, in, in the lateral direction. So now I talked about the crystalline swelling, osmotic swelling in liquid water. That was actually studied, uh, the first paper, I, we, we, in, we, we in this area are, are aware about, was by Langmuir, 1930, well, he got a Nobel Prize in 32, but his his, uh, his paper was on clays, was in 1938, and he suggested that when you exfoliate these clays in water, they form pneumatic phases, meaning that the, the one nanometer thick platelets are separate in water, and if the concentration is high enough, they will, are not able to rotate. So then you get a pneumatic or organization of the, of the, in, the, in, the, in the suspension. 
So also eventually now in the last, let's say 15 years, many people have studied this quite a bit. And this is typical uh, problem for small angle X-ray scattering. So you get peaks from the orientation of the, of the platelets. And in some place, you actually get fixed distances. Not, so it's not really pneumatic, it's more like a smectic because you have a, a characteristic distance between the, the, the platelets. So you see peaks in the small angle scattering when you sh shoot X-rays on such a suspension. This kind of organization, pneumatic organization of suspensions of clays, you can also observe in cross polarizers. And you see the typical barrier vincent uh, textures and defects. This is an other example of something we have done in, in, in this era. This was done in people in, in Recife, actually, in, in the Pernambuco. And we studied uh, the pneumatic phases in MRI. So we studied anisotropy in water diffusion. Uh, water diffuses along the platelet, but not perpendicular to them. So then we can actually characterize the pneumatic phase in the magnetic field in, in this way. When, so I, I mentioned that there is some um, interaction between the platelets because we observe some fixed distances, even in suspension. And that, in principle, comes from the DLVO interaction, which is van der Waals attraction and electrostatic repulsion screened by ions in the water. So how much salt you have in the water governs distances between clay platelets in suspension. When you add more salt, these suspensions, pneumatic suspensions, can re-aggregate. If you add much salt, van der Waals eventually can win. And then you can get re-aggregation in various types of structures, depending on, on salinity and, and, and pH. So I won't go into that, but that, 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 that can happen. So this. Then you can have, this is a system we have studied where, you have, where we have measured the phase diagram, concentration and salt. And we can go from a repulsive pneumatic where the distance between the platelets is governed by the size of the container and the concentration of the, of, of the clay platelets to an attractive pneumatic where the distance is governed by the DLVO and a minimum decided by a combination of van der Waals and electrostatic repulsion. So then uh, in, uh, in what I'm going to say in the coming is uh, there are two concepts I need to introduce. It's cation exchange is one of them. Is that now we're talking about these cations in the in in interlayer. It's very easy to change these cations and make a system where this could be sodium, for example, or it could be lithium or it could be nickel, or it could be something else sitting there. And that is important for some of the things I'm going to talk about now. What kind of cation is sitting there? And there is a very simple process to do this exchange. Another concept that is going to be important is called interstratification. It turns out, in what I'm going to show you, that the clays really like to have ordered interstratification. If you do this cation exchange, and then you dry the system afterwards, the clay really likes to have different cations in every second layer. And that is important for the, for the, say, um, all, for the applications I'm going to mention. So, so and this is visual in the clays I'm going to show because we, have, we are studying clays now that are very sharp charge distribution. There are very few defects very uniform uh, charge distribution uh, in, the, in, in the layers. In natural clays, you usually don't observe this ordered interstratification. You observe something called random interstratification, where the, 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 it's not in every second layer. You have different cations, but in some random or, organization. That is called, uh, say, random interstratification instead of ordered interstratification. So the clays we are studying now, 
we get from this guy in Germany, University of Bayreuth. They synthesize this clay called sodium fluorohexoride with the large aspect ratio, meaning like uh, typically 20 micrometers in the lateral dimensions, very pure and very uniform charge distribution. That's why we can see things like this order data certification I, I mentioned. That means also that we can use, this is a very recent paper, it actually appeared like a few days ago, and it, uh, uh, where we measured together with, uh, with some, well, it's samples coming from Germany, simulations by, uh, by um, Caetano and Alessandro, who is sitting here, and us in Norway, we measured the band gap. And that sort of gives a hint that these systems can be used for something high-tech. Because we can imagine that when we know this, it's, it's sharp, so we can use the clays, for instance, we think, in, uh, in say, uh, capacitors. Now I'm going to talk about CO2 because that's one activity that we have. And uh, why is that interesting in the context of clays? So if clays, this is a uh, Dexel card, should capture CO2, then uh, well, I showed that they easily capture water because water is attracted to the interlayer cations. But there is a difference between water and CO2 that CO2 is non-polar. So why should CO2 enter in those inter interlayers? So we have done some, um, some experiments where we show that CO2 actually enter in those inter interlayers. And we have been working on that. We have worked on that for 10 years before we understood what was going on. So why, why is it interesting to study CO, CO2 and clays? Um, one, one, one thing is uh, say reservoir integrity and stability. One, 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 uh, one activity these days is to store CO2 in empty reservoirs. And then there are often clays in those reservoirs. And to know how CO2 interacts with that clay is interesting and can be useful maybe. The other thing which I'm more interested in is it can, CO, can clays be used as a material like zeolites or MOF materials or other materials that, that people study for CO2 capture or separation. Meaning, for, for instance, I will come back to this. Can it be used, for example, in blue hydrogen processing? Blue hydrogen is hydrogen produced from natural gas, methane. So you mix that with water, you go through some process and out comes a mixture of hydrogen and CO2. Then the, the goal then is to use hydrogen to run your car or airplanes. And then, but you need to separate the CO2 from the hydrogen. So if you, you, need, you are looking for materials that capture CO2, but not hydrogen in, in, this, in this process. So now imagine that this clay card can capture CO2. The, so, and, and the materials used for say capture gases are porous materials. The porosity of the clay is very compact. It's a very compact system. If you take, imagine that you have a one meter by one meter, one cubic meter, or clay, compact clay material, that actually contains 2,000 square kilometers of surface area. If you, if you have a, a powder with a packing density of 0.6, it reduces to, to 1,200 1, square kilometers, but it's still a large, large area. Now we know that there are about one cation sitting in these interlayers per square nanometers. If it, Assume that each of these cations can capture two CO2 molecules, like it can capture easily more than CO2 water molecules. If it can capture two CO2 molecules, this should give a 14% mass increase of the clay when it's saturated with, with CO2, which is equivalent to 0.222 tons CO2 per cubic meter of clay, if you do this exercise. We actually check this by actually mesh weighing the clay exposing it to CO2, 
and look at the weight in, increase and it matches more or less. We got 10% mass increase instead of 14% mass increase in the, in the clay that we, that we studied. So to study this interaction with CO, with CO2, we want to know where that we do, where do the, where does the CO2 go? We do that by X-ray diffraction. How much we do a gravimetric experiment and how and why we do spectrometry, neutron or Raman, for instance, and the DFT simulations. By doing this, we can answer these questions. So I will skip these things to some more experimental uh, details. When we started to work on CO2 and clays, 2010, we only knew about this paper in this area, suggested that clays capture CO, CO2. So we published a paper in 2012, which is this one, and at that time, many other groups published papers on, the, on, on this and, and since together with us. So we have several papers on this. And recently we have increased our activity on this and until here, still at this point, we did not understand what was going on. Then during, uh, just during COVID, we have understood what's going on, we think. So, what we observed was that some interlayer, for some interlayer cation situations, there is no shift in the Bragg peak, no swelling when we expose this, this, this uh, dexal card to CO2. So CO2 does not go into the inter interlayer. But there are two cases, lithium and nickel, where it does. The other ions we have studied here, nothing happens, basically. So CO they don't capture CO2. So the interlayer cation is important. We also, in this paper, we estimated how, well, we did gravimetric experiments. So we, we found that the, the capture, CO2 capture, for the case of nickel in our clay, we capture an, an amount of CO2 comparable to the best materials. So it means that the clay is a good performer in terms of, say, uh, volumetric uh, capacity for, uh, for CO2 capture. So why is nickel such a good case? To understand that, we went back to some mystery we had in some older papers. You see there are lots of Brazilians in all these papers. When you see papers with me, you always see all, most of the authors are Brazilians. Uh, uh, but then in any case, uh, the we have observed before, uh, previously, that nickel is, when we dry the nickel samples, get rid of all the water, it does not collapse to one nanometer distance between the, the platelets. It stops at 11.4. This we did not understand. In this paper, we understood it. Actually, it is due to this uh, ordered interstratification that I mentioned. When we in the original sample, we have sodium ions in, the, in these inter interlayers. When we exchange with nickel ions, it turns out that in every second interlayer, we get nickel hydroxide, and in every second interlayer, we get nickel. The average of those two D spacings gives 11.4. That's, and that doubles the unit cell distance. It's not shown here, but we actually, in the nickel case, we have a super, structure peak at, at uh, corresponding to a larger unit cell. What we further realized is that the CO2 is captured only in those interlayers that have nickel hydroxide. So the nickel hydroxide is the reason why we capture CO2. It's not the bare ion, it's the nickel hydro hydro hydroxide. Actually, how it captures CO2, we are not sure about yet. How, how it attaches to the nickel hydroxide is something we are working on. We did some other game, was to, was to actually uh, synthesize the clays in different ways so that we can play around with the surface charge on the clay platelets in such a way that, well, the surface charge controls the number of cations that are sitting there. So we found that 
lower surface charge, meaning lower number of interlayer cations, is more efficient for capturing CO2. And we believe that is due to the fact that when you have low, fewer number of cations, there is more space for CO2 to be, uh, to be captured. There are more, we have these nickel hydroxide islands in there, and they are, there's more space around them and more edges, so we capture more CO2. We are also looking at what happens with CO2 when there is water, when we don't dry the clay completely, but there is water there in the beginning. So that's been discussed in this paper, and we just this month, last month, submitted this, this paper with other cations than the ones I mentioned. So how can we get something uh, in applications out of this? Uh, the clay we have, so this is synthetic clay. It turns out, I mentioned that the surface charge is, the optimum surface charge is, 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 uh, is the lower charge. That lower charge is the same charge as we find in the natural clay called bentonite. So the, the upscaling of this into industry would be to do, repeat these experiments, and we already started that, with use of, um, Go back a little bit to repeat this experiment, and we are actually in the process of doing that using natural clay bentonite instead of the synthetic clays we have been using to understand what's going on. So now we, are, we have, think we have understood it, now we can use it. I will skip this and I go to something completely different, seemingly. How much time do I have now? Uh, Twenty minutes left. Okay, this is another issue, which seemingly is very different, but it's the same, and it has to do with how we play around with the clay at the nano scale. We do the, the same game in this case as we did with the CO two. So this is a paper we published this this year, and it's about structural coloration using clays. So for the CO two capture, we work in the crystalline swelling regime. In this case, we work in the osmotic swelling regime and the nematic phases in suspension. So there are two kinds of colors in the world. There are the chemical colors and the physical colors. I'm a physicist, I like the physical colors. So the physical colors is inter interference, is like you see in the rainbow or, or, or the soap bubble. The chemical colors that are mostly used industrially, you see what is not absorbed. It comes back to you. In nature, this mechanism, physical coloration, structural coloration, is another name for it, is the most common. Let's look at this butterfly wing. It has this structure. You shine white light on it, and back to you comes some interference based on these distances, these nano-structured distances. That interference is the color that you, that, you, that you see. So this mechanism is very different from this one. And this is industry presently. This is nature presently. So then we knew about this paper, titanite nanosheets in suspension. You control the distances between them by concentration in water. So this is called uh, photonic water. Most of the material is water. There are some platelets with some distance and you get colors back based by, by interference, based on interference from layers in the, in the depth here. So it's basically Bragg's law again. So then, we tried the same experiment with clays. We took our clay, this time with sodium cations in here. We did laminate it in water. We shine white light on it, and we look at the light coming back. And you see some tendency of coloration. Not very impressive. We call this mediocre colors. It's not very, nothing we would publish. But then we did a check. We did the ordered interstratification in the in the clay. So we had we put cesium ions in every second inter, inter, interlayer. Then we did the delamination. So now we have the suspension 
or platelets that are not single clay platelets, but double clay platelets with cesium in between them. From that suspension, we got very bright colors. So the reason for this is that these double layers are less transparent than the single layers. The single layers are almost fully transparent. Now, graphene is a single sheet of graphene is almost fully transparent. So, so with the single sheets of clay, fully transparent, you shine white light on them, on the single sheets, and the light goes straight through. These ones, you get, they, are, they have a partial mirror effect. So you get something reflected. And it's enough to get very nice in, inter, interference and very in, colors that we vary just by volume percent of clay platelets in the suspension, which controls this distance between them. So this thing that was shown down here, this shows that it's very, if you, you take this, platelets, put them in water, mix a little bit, you get colors right away. It's a very rapid process to make these colors. The, uh, yeah, and, and one thing that is important is that there's a dark background. So, because most of the light you shine through this system goes through, and most of the white light goes, goes through. So you need something underneath here to absorb the white light if you have a white background here, the light comes back and you see no color. This is what was shown here. Actually, this is, if you look at the peacock, this is exactly what you see. If you look at the back of a peacock, it's dark. In the front, you see bright colors. The colors you see in front is interference, com comes back to you based on the structuring in the feathers of the peacock based on the structures you see on the feathers of the peacock. Our system is, is, is the same. We have a dark background. If you say, if I go back to this one, show so this one more, one more time. You see, there's a white paper underneath. We, will, we just pull out the white paper and you see the color. If, if the light is reflected, you see nothing. You need to absorb the white light that goes through. Exactly the same thing has happened in the, in the peacock. Another interesting issue with our structural coloration is the non iridescence. It looks, this, it looks, the color doesn't change with angle. The reason is that the clay platelets bend a little bit. And this is built into our system. You don't have to do anything particular. The clay platelets just bend, they, they, they are not stiff. So we get angle independent coloration. If these were completely flat and stiff, you will get angle dependent color very sharply. So you have to look at different angles, you will see a different color. In our system, no, because of this. This is a mystery. I said that we, we get these bright colors because there is a fixed distance. There's some interaction between the clay platelets. So that makes at least some domains, typically 10 to 15 clay layers in each domain, with the fixed distance between them. And we don't quite understand what controls this distance. This is something we're working on, because I, I mentioned DLVO, which combination of van der Waals and electrostatic repulsion. And the electrostatic repulsion is, a, is tuned by adding salt to the water. These dark lines here is what you expect from the DLVO, and our distances are far away. But still, we can control the color by adding salt to the water. We've, we tried that because we know about DLVO, of course, but it does not follow the DLVO model for this. So this is a friend of mine. She, her name is Sylvia from Cambridge. She works on cellulose and structural coloration. That's another material, lots of activity going on in, in that area, structural coloration. She made this slide. She presented in, in Lisboa earlier this year in the liquid crystal conference. And it's sort of illustrate the problem with present day pigments. 
So on one axis, there is toxicity, and on the other axis, sustainability. And the color code is about price. So those three issues are important for pigments. Most the chemical pigments that are used in paints and so on, they are toxic and not sustainable in general. I mean, they fade with time and they release materials into the surroundings that are not good. Sustainable pigments, that could be the cellulose I mentioned, or it could be our clays. Well, as I mentioned, clays are abundant, they are non-toxic, they are good in this sense. But when I say that, that we maybe these uh, suspensions of the clay layers can be made, can make pigments like this, you should say that that's not a good idea because most of the material in my suspension is, is water and only 1% clay. So it doesn't really matter whether the clays are sustainable or not, because only 1%, the, the, the functionality, the color comes from the clay, but most of the material is the matrix. And to make, make uh, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that. So, but we have this advantage, as I showed, our process of self-assembly is very rapid. Another issue, which is uh, important in the in the area of structural coloration, is it's very difficult to make a red color in, the, in this way. Actually, birds, if you look at nature, birds that are red usually have a pigment, a chemical pigment. Birds that are blue are structurally colored. So one, one uh, so these are general statements, there are exceptions. Well, so this is a blue butterfly, structurally colored blue butterfly. This structure has been mimicked by Lexus. They have made this car painted by pigments that are based on this. This is a long time consuming process. It's not industrially interesting because it takes eight months to produce sufficient pigments for 200 cars. This is a very intricate, complicated structure. Our structure is much, our say, process is much faster. We easily beat this. Uh, our structure is not an exact mimicking of nature. It's a like, mimicking of the, say, uh, concept, not of the exact structure. And we can make red color. Why, what, what, what is this red color issue about? This you can read more about it in, in this, these two papers, for example. Imagine that well, some, some people in this area work on colloidal packings to make structural colorations. Just packing of say spherical colloidal particles. That's the simplest example. Let's say that you have a, a particle here where the and then when you observe something in the back scattering, since I do x-rays, I'm used to thinking about form factors and structure factors to explain things. So each particle gives a form factor to the scattering and the packing gives a structure factor. So imagine that these particles have a blue diameter, a diameter corresponding to a blue color. Then the, the form factor is blue. If you pack them very densely together, you also get a blue structure factor. If you take these blue particles and pack them loosely, you get a red structure factor because the distances between the particles increases, so you can get a red structure factor. But they still have the blue form factor, and that will dominate and destroy the red. That's basically why it's so difficult to make a red from structural coloration in, in, in this way. You can think, uh, you can say that, well, why don't you then make red diameter particles and pack red particles? But if you look at a red diameter particle, it has more blue distances in it. Then the red distances say, say that this is this is a diameter, but if you move away from the diameter, you get all the other color distances. And the outermost one is blue. And you get mostly blue. So this doesn't help you either. You have mostly blue from a red diameter colloidal particle. So the way around this is to use core shell particles. So the distances that give interference is the distance between the cores and you have a transparent shell around the core. If you pack those, you can get red. Problem with this, 
it's, it's not very industrially upscalable. The chameleon is red. And that's because the chameleon has actually solved this, has actually, actually solved this problem. The, the uh, distances, uh, the chameleon skin has distances between inclusions in the skin. So when the skin is relaxed, it's greenish. When the, the chameleon gets excited, it stretches the skin and the distances increase and it becomes red. This is the same as the core shell case. So the chameleon solved this problem. So, and we solve this problem because our form factor is in the X-ray range because of the thin platelets. Our structure factor is in the color range. So how do we get to industry from this? The most important thing is to replace the, well, what we have to do is to replace the water with a stiff matrix, something that is solid and transparent. So that's what we're looking for now. That's the stage of development where we, where, where we are now. So we imagine making some foil where there is not water in between the platelets, but some transparent solid matrix of some sort. We, we grind that foil out into flaky pigments and we put those pigments in another matrix that evaporates and we paint it on the wall. That's the, that's, that is the, the, the future of this. How much time do I have now? Anybody knows? Just a few slides left. So now I mentioned two ways for clays to become the industrial high-tech CO2 and colors. Last week, I was here together with my three postdocs. We were in the MRS meeting in Boston and we presented some posters. So those three, four posters, illustrate other activities that we are doing in the in the group at the moment. One is synthesis of graphene. So what we have done, we have taken these clay stacks. Into there, we have put dye molecules, saffronin or malachite, in one of those. Then we heat up this to 700 degrees and out comes graphene inside there. So we can we synthesize graphene inside there at much lower temperatures than bulk synthesis of, of graphene. So the low temperature issue is important here. So this has not been published yet, but we are we are in the we have we are submitting this. Of course, we are submitting it to good uh, journals, and they come back, and we have to resubmit and so on. But this process is. Is, is going on. So that was one, that was one poster we had. One, another poster we had is this. We make suspensions, hybrid suspensions of clay and graphene oxide. So I mentioned that clays, I mean, clays are just one nanometer thin layers, but clays are non-conducting. So it's interesting for various applications to mix them with conducting layers and make hybrid structures of non-conducting and, 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 and conducting. So this is what we have done here. We have found a way to attach graphene oxide to the clay. So that was another poster. Then this is the third poster we had in this meeting is in, in last week, wrinkling. Wrinkling of nanolayers is important. For instance, if you use uh, graphene or graphene oxide for, for uh, detectors, gas detectors, the wrinkles are important. It's important that they are wrinkled. The wrinkles create hotspots for absorption on such materials. And that's what we are, so what we, what we can do with this, with, this, with this clays, we can attach nanoparticles to the clays, put them on the substrate and control the wrinkling of the clay. On top of that, we can put graphene or graphene oxide, and this 
and in that way control the wrinkling of the graphene. That's that's one thing we can we, we have achieved. So these are AFM images showing that how we can control graphene wrinkling by depositing graphene on top of clay sheets where we have controlled the wrinkling. So we are depositing graphene oxide on top of uh, clay with controlled wrinkling, and then the graphene follows the, that, that wrinkling. <clears throat> well, another issue that we are looking into is not mixing it with graphene, but the, just the clay layers themselves. This is an experiment that was done by our collaborators in Germany. They take a, they take a clay layer, they put it on a flexible substrate. It is stretched when they put it on. They put the clay on top, they release the stress, and then the clay wrinkles. And this actually shows how easy it is to wrinkle these clay sheets. Then the, there's a wavelength in the, in the, in the wrinkles, and there's, a, there's, a, there's an amplitude. And from, from this, you can estimate the thickness of the layer and the elastic moduli of this by doing this experiment. What we are looking into is to see if these say, uh, ridges of the wrinkles can create hotspots for absorption for, mo for molecules, because that's something that we are interested in to see how these nanosheets of clay can absorb molecules. Let's say that you have a, a ridge like this, then you expose the internal of the clay structure more than if you are in a valley of, the, of this wrinkling. So you will have some variations, probably, of electric field. You will have different electric fields on the, on the, on the ridges compared to the valleys. So this is something we are looking into with similar simulations together with Alessandro and Kaitan. Then also when we have done that for a while, we will do experiments. This is the last poster we had in Boston. In this case, we have actually intercalated magnetic nanoparticles in the in the clays. And what we can do by this random, well, well this ordered intercalation process, we can produce two kinds of products. We can produce nano sheets, double layer sheets with magnetic particles on both sides. We can delaminate that, and we can create uh, suspensions with with uh, one layer of clay with magnetic particles attached to one side. That we can, why, why, why do we, why, I mean, what could that be used for? You know, uh, what is generally used often for, say, diagnostic purposes to capture biological molecules in blood or suspensions or whatever in devices are core shell magnetic particles. Then you use a magnet to pull the, mag to, to pull the particles out and you an analyze what you have captured. We can do the same with our clays. The advantage of using the clays could be, this is something I have not proved, it could be that we, an advantage to, uh, is we could increase the sensitivity of such a thing such a concept because you have much larger surface area available than you have in a core shell particle. So we could capture more and we can use a magnet to pull it out, just like here. That's the idea. We are working on that. So the activities, uh, the main, uh, let's say 60, 70% of the activities in our lab these days is nano Lego, as I have explained. This all this playing around with sheets and particles and so on. So we are make we are making these structures and we are making mixtures of nanoparticles and sheets in 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 various ways. <coughs> so that's my last slide. So all things I've told you, <coughs> I need to thank former, present students and postdocs and to very clever collaborators all over the world, including in Brazil many of them. So thank you for your attention. And that's just to mention what I, the message, main message is that the high tech is hidden down there. Thank you.
So thank you, Yonoto, for these very nice presentations regarding the clay material and its applications. So now we are open to questions. So the, the audience, if you have questions, please. Thanks, Walter. I have a, one question about the magnetism that you showed before, not with this magnetic yes. nanoparticles. Sorry. The magnetism you showed before, yeah. when you said that just the, the aura you have, when you put a magnetic field, you can orient this, this clays. Yeah. I mean, the, the thing I did in the receiver. Yeah. yeah. What's the origin of this magnetism? Is it diamagnetism? Oh, yeah. This is diamagnetism. Okay, so one Tesla is necessary to work to orient this uh, small clays. But what's the orientation with respect to the magnetic field? Uh, the it's longest, perpendicular. The longest axis along uh, along the magnetic field in, in, in that case. Ah, okay. Yeah. Well, uh, this could change when we... When we uh, uh, attach magnetic particles to them. So this is something we are exploring. Uh, maybe the orientation could be changed, changed, changed. The platelet orientation could be changed because then the, the magnetic field uh, uh, interaction would mainly be via the magnetic particles. So th this is something we, we, are, we are looking into. Yes, because the magnetic moment of each particle in principle mm -hmm. are in the random orientation when you put over the clay yeah so when they put the magnetic field it would not respond if it's yeah, but in order the, the, the there direction could, there could be a rotation of the magnetic particles it uh, depends on the field if the uh, field is high enough you have yeah. this type of and movement. it could also depend on the attachment how strong is the attachment and so on so so th these are things we are we are looking at. okay yeah. thanks Uh, so, you know, too, we have a question on the chat. The yeah. Rafaela de Oliveira is asking about uh, the perspectives for the 2D applications of the clays. Yeah, I would say that uh, what I mentioned in the very beginning on the supercapacitors, I mean, it's a very high band gap. Uh, and it's, it's in general larger uh, aspect ratios than, than, than many alternatives. It, it's purer. So I, I think the sort of supercapacitors would be one obvious thing, but in any, so I, I would, you always need the combination of, of uh, insulating and, and conducting materials. And then uh, as a component for, uh, conduct, for insulating material, I think clay would be the winner in my opinion. So I, I, the specific thing it would be the supercapacitors. Uh, thank you for your talk. It's an amazing talk. And I have a high tech and a low tech question. The high tech, can these technology be used for batteries? It's very difficult to hear. Can the, these the... technology be used for batteries? Uh, you have charged surfaces, so can we charge them and uncharge them? Well, that goes back to the supercapacitor issue, I, I guess. Again, so in that you can you can say a capacitor is a battery. Uh, so, but they are not. But you can also do things with the clays, like um, um, internally in the in in the layers. But in, in the synthesis, you can do something to the intralayer cathode, not only the in, interlayer. So I really have not thought much about it, but I think uh, there are actually the German group that we work with, they, they have some papers in, 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 in this area. Okay. So I, I, I don't know exactly. I, I could say something wrong if I try to talk about it. It's the low tech about. question is what happens when you fire clay? So uh, is the water going out? What? Oh, no, no. That you mean the um, ceramics? Yes. Yeah. Those are the non-swelling clays. So those are I mentioned in the beginning. That we can distinguish two types: swelling and non-swelling. The uh, the most prominent member of the non-swelling clays is kaolinite, and kaolinite uh, is what you use in porcelain. And when you fire that, you center the particles together. 
it's a it's a it's a sintering process. Okay. It's a high temperature sinter, sinter, sintering process. There is no water intercalated in the kaolin art. Okay. Mm -hmm. And what are the um, uh, let me say the characteristics are the uh, additives you can increase plasticity of the clay so this is probably a very high uh, a very important a, i have a really hard time reading. how do you increase or control the plasticity of clay the plasticity yes yeah that is uh, now then i mean uh, also mentioned in the beginning that clays are used as rheology modifiers and you can use gels you make hydrogels or gels out of clays then you are talking about the nano sheet clays again this, the swelling clays, and then the water contents is important. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Hi. Uh, about the CO two storage, uh, how much uh, stable uh, the CO two sits in the if, if, if it stays inside? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I I think I forgot to say that what we need to. It's it's mod. We need to get the CO two in at room temperature. We need moderate pressures, like I would say, three to five bars. If you keep the pressure, the CO two stays in there. Uh, if we if we um, uh, lower the temperature, not much below zero, the, the CO two will stay. So that's why it's an interesting case for actually capturing CO two. In a say in, in a column in a in a gas stream, you capture the CO two. Let's say the hydrogen goes through because you want it. Then then you can empty the column, pump the CO two into the ground, and use reuse the column in, indefinitely because this is a reversible process. That's what we have found. That's also why we don't we have suggested that the capture mechanism could be a carbonate formation of the of the uh, say CO, CO2 together with those nickel hydroxides, carbonate like formation, but that does not quite match with the fact that this is reversible. We can get this, we get the CO2 out again. We don't know, if, but we don't know actually if it comes out again as CO2 because we have measured what comes out. But the mass, we regain the mass, everything we put in comes out again. If you release the, if you release the pressure or heat it up a little bit. But these are moderate temperatures and moderate pressures for this case. So it's not a very energy consuming uh, thing to, to actually control this, this uh, capture of CO2. So there are more questions. Yeah. When you put the magnetic field in the clays, the small piece of clay, you said that the long axis of the clay will be aligned parallel to the magnetic field. So in principle, you have a uniaxial crystal. But if you increase the concentration of the clay, it could not be possible to have a biaxial. Yeah, you. These clays that we are studying are not monodispersed, right? They are they always have a long axis yeah. in, 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 in effect because the, the they are one nanometer thick, but they are irregular in shape and there is always a long axis axis. Mm -hmm. So so yes, but when you uh, when you align one axis, the clay could be like that everywhere. Yeah, 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 yeah. But if but, you increase the concentration, yeah. you can put one. Yeah, yeah, the, that is that is true. So, so if if you have low concentration, you have this this yeah. this this freedom. If you have high concentration, you 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 don't have this freedom anymore. Yeah. 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 Uh, this this we know. This we have observed. But you have observed yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, you have published that. Yeah, yeah. yeah it, it's hidden in some uh, part of it is hidden in some paper. But we are also it's also part of our recent work on the nanoplatelets with magnetic particles attached. And in, in that's on its way to being published. But do you measure the birefringences or not? Yeah, we measure birefringences. In the biax, you have two birefringences. I mean, just oh, simple birefringences in cross polarizers and a, and, a, and a camera. They are not measured with, the, say, your ah, kind of. Ah, so you measure one of the birefringences, uh, uh, yeah. even the biaxial. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
So, but it could uh, in, be interesting to do that uh, yeah. with you here. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Thanks. Yeah, I also have a, a question. So I would like to to hear more about the applications of the clay materials. For instance, you did a comment regarding the blue and green hydrogen. So can you comment a bit more about, so how far away we are from our, uh, our really employ the clay materials in such kind of applications? To employ the clay material or uh, other, because the other materials have, go, have come further than the clay. We are, our competitors I mentioned like zeolites or MOF materials, porous materials. Yeah, for the... So the, they have more, they are closer to the, maybe they are better politicians, I don't know, but they are, they are, they are, they are closer to the applications than mm -hmm. the clays are. Uh, and... Uh, I would say that the MOF materials that are very popular in, uh, in, for, in studies of all kinds of say, absorption pro problems, they are, they are, they are porous, uh, but they are toxic, they are not stable, and they are synthetic and expensive. The clays win on all those issues. So uh, it, we have some difficulty convincing both funding agencies and industry about uh, how excellent the, the, the clays are, because we already proved that in terms of capacity, they are as good as the others. Yeah. So we have a job to do with the, with the, so getting, because we are, I mean, I'm a physicist, I cannot start to make big uh, sort of uh, facilities with uh, all kinds of engineering and stuff to use, to put this in and Im implement it. It's, it's far from there because we, we, we need to, well, the first thing we need to do is some pilot scale experiments. I, I, I skipped one, one, one slide of that. What we imagine is we make some, let's say 10 centimeter diameter and meter long column of clay powder, functionalized in the way so that we have the nickel hydroxides there or some other hydroxide that captures the CO2. Then we run a stream of gas through there and we see that nothing comes out. This, they are, they are not even done those pilot experiments yet. So that needs to be done. Now we have understood the material properties, we have understood the mechanism, but to go from there to real engineering and applications is, depends on how much money we get. If we get enough money, we can do it. Yeah. Okay, so more questions? So I think so. Thank you again for the nice presentation.